Redondo Beach, it is just an honor to introduce this morning's guest speaker. It's Reverend Dr. Maureen Hoyt. She is an amazing light in the New Thought Movement. She is a teacher of teachers. Many, many ministers who have successful centers have been schooled and taught by Dr. Maureen. She is the former senior minister, spiritual director of the Westlake Village Center for Spiritual Living. She is a friend of ours from Lake Arrowhead. She's done the wisdom sharing here with Dr. Sue Rubin and Dr. Moira. And let's just give her a really heartfelt welcome. <laughs> so happy to be here. It's a, um, it's kind of like uh, coming home a little bit. Uh, not so much to the building, but to the people here. Because of, uh, thank you, because of my experience not only with Arrowhead. Can I move this uh, down? Yes, thank you very much. Um, not only because my experience here with um, the Wisdom Group with Dr. Sue and uh, Dr. Moira, but for the Arrowhead experience. And as I look out, I can see uh, some of the faces that I recognize and some of the wonderful people that we've had time with. I want to thank Dr. Moira for the privilege of being here. I know that she was um, somewhat urged, let's just say that, by Beverly Conover and Reverend Kathy to get me here this morning because it's a long trek to come from Westlake. But I do have to say, traffic was light. Uh, traffic was light. And I know you all came this morning for the air conditioning. Um, yeah, I'm a realist. I'm a realist. Either that or the coffee and donuts afterwards. Yes, yes. Well, September, the September theme for the Centers for Spiritual Living as a whole is uh, community service. And um, while many ministers are not necessarily following the themes uh, for the month, I particularly like this one because it came from uh, Reverend uh, Mike McMorrow, who is one of my protégés and who took over the Center for Spiritual Living in Granada Hills after I left there about 10 years ago, and he's still there. And, um, you know, the past few months have been, and I'm going to tell in myself totally this morning, the past few months have been, um, have been difficult, even for the most spiritually evolved people. And um, for us to be able to admit that as religious scientists puts us in a kind of a vulnerable position, wouldn't you say? Because everything's always good with religious scientists. Everything's always good. I'm not going to wax political today, but uh, part of the story uh, that I want to share with you um, lets you know the extent to which I was affected by uh, what happened in Charlottesville particularly, and of course subsequently the Houston and everything else that's going on in our world. Somebody recently asked the question, what is enlightenment? And the answer is, it's when we are bothered by nothing. <laughs> well, nothing. I'm not quite there yet. I'm not quite there yet. Can we, can we totally achieve this? I'm not sure. Um, I know that while we are masterpieces, every one of us is a work in progress. We are. Anyone who's an artist, Val, you know about what I'm talking about. You know, a painting is never really finished, even when it's finished. And so you're masterpieces and works in progress. The connection to source, God, the force, spirit can be weakened, but the source itself remains steadfast. Our connection can be weakened sometimes. And that's what I held on to in hearing about the three who lost their lives in Charlottesville. I was transported back in time to 1960s San Francisco. I feel like, uh, what's that little lady on the Golden Girls? Well, Italy, 
1942. No, this is San Francisco, 1968. And I lived there for 10 years, and I was invested. I had time and energy in marching for civil rights. I, like Mother Teresa, marched for peace. The women's movement and integration, and they all seem to have gone unnoticed 50 years later. Does anybody else of my age think about that sometimes? You know, like, wait, what happened here? What happened? And um, we're still experiencing the same unrest that we did uh, in the 60s. And for a little while, I lost my way. I lost my way. Where is my connection to God in all of this, I thought to myself. I was uh, not a hippie in the 60s. I contributed to society by being a, um, uh, managing a full-time job, going to college, and working with uh, RAP, which was the Real Alternatives Program for te Teenagers at Risk. And um, yes, I had an afro in those days, which I, I pin curled to achieve the desired result every night. It wasn't natural. It wasn't natural. But I marched for peace in my business suit with my afro. That was my contribution. And having emigrated to the United States from a little tiny town in British Columbia, Kimberley, British Columbia, a town of 5,000 people, it was such a conundrum to me why anyone would discriminate against people of different religions, races, or sexual orientations. We didn't have that in my town. You know, perhaps I was naive about such things, and I probably was, but these were not the issue as I was growing up. Everyone in this town knew everyone's business. And when a new physician came to town uh, from Trinidad with a much darker complexion than anyone we'd ever seen since the Globetrotters had come to town, <laughs> um, <laughs> we, um, we just saw it as a physical characteristic. You know, there wasn't anything to discriminate against. He was there to do good work. And of course, I digress as I usually do, but. We were innocent in those days, and we lived somewhat of an idyllic life. At least I did. I did. Now, fast forward to our move to California at the height of the peace movement and civil rights and the integration. It was overwhelming to me at times. But not having had any experience in civil unrest, I was already, even in those days, being overly optimistic and seeing the good in everyone, and I held fast to my own sense of serenity. It was necessary for me because I had fallen away from the Catholic Church. I didn't really have any spirituality except that which I knew was already inside me, and I really didn't um, have anything to hang on to. And like I said, but my, my connection to God was weakened somewhat but God itself remains steadfast. Now, Reverend uh, Mike's outline for today honors Labor Day and workers everywhere. And it was his intention to explore how the science of mind works in everyday life. That was how he started out his theme for the day. Every day, as far as I'm concerned, is a labor of love. Every single day. That's the intention that I have when I wake up in the morning. It's not just the work that we do to earn a living. It's the work that we do on a daily basis to maintain our spiritual equilibrium in the face of circumstances to the contrary. That's really what the objective is for us. I would love to say that it's for everybody, but I think religious scientists might have a little bit of a monopoly on this because we know that we are caused to our own effect. And when I wake up in the morning and decide to be happy for the day, I am caused to my own effect. That's how it shows up for me. My everyday life has changed significantly in the last uh, year. I left the pulpit at the beginning of July last year and I've never looked back. Somebody said to me, asked me this morning, do I miss the pulpit? No. I don't. Um, I like speaking every once in a while, but I also know that my life is taking a different direction. As uh, Dr. Sue said, when she retired, she didn't retire, she rewired, and that's kind of what I've done. 
As one elderly congregant said to, uh, to me one day, he said, you can't move forward by looking in the rear view mirror. Okay, I got a few people with that one. But somebody else said, you can't embrace the end of the story by reading the last chapter over and over again. And that really, really hit me hard. I know about being in service to others. I've shared the last 30 years of my life in service through my ministry, and I will continue to do that. I'm always going to be a practitioner, always. And as it turns out, I'm always going to be a minister. I don't know. We must send out vibrations of some kind, you know. Get on an airplane and sit next to somebody, and you find out you're ministering to them halfway through the flight. <laughs> That's just the way it works. It's just the way it works. And the way that that service shows up today is radically different than I expected. Radically different. What I discovered about myself and my reaction to Charlottesville is that we are trying to solve problem this that the, we're trying to solve the same problems with the same con the consciousness that created the problem we're trying to solve something without new thinking in order for us to move forward with a world that works for everyone which is the global theme for the centers for spiritual living we have to find ways for individuals to express themselves from a place of solution-oriented thinking instead of problem-oriented thinking. Now, if we could just put that in a bottle, we'd be millionaires, right? We'd be millionaires. When Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, he was prophetic in his approach to how things could change if we were all on the same boat. I'm not trying to minimize what he said or what he did, but the dream has been interrupted. The dream has been interrupted. In the Talmud, it says a dream uninterrupted is like a letter unopened. Whoa. When I read that the other day, I thought our dream for civil rights, for equality, for religious freedom, for women's rights, is an uninterrupted dream. Everything has to happen exactly the way it happens in order for us to see how principle is working in our lives. And it's all about me as Mark so beautifully said. It's all about you, it's all about us. We are the leaders we've been looking for. We are the leaders that we've been looking for. Years and years ago, and this, a long time ago, I went to an event where Oprah was on the panel, Maria Shriver was on the panel, and Gloria Steinem was on the panel. And Gloria Steinem said during that um, talk that she gave, that nothing ever changes from complacency or contentment. It only changes from irritation. And by golly, I've been irritated. I've been really irritated for the last little bit. I'm responsible for my own consciousness in this mess we call the government these days. We all need to have dreams interrupted periodically to see just how spiritual we are. And my favorite thing I tell my students is, go spend a week with your family of origin and see how spiritual you are. <laughs> yes, yes. I love my family. I love my family. But, you know, sometimes their behavior is inconsistent with their perfection. I get that. <laughs> you know, the, every time I say that, it cracks me up. It just cracks me up. I laugh inside, so I, I don't, anyway, never mind. You know, every time something happens in one area of the world, the one mind and the social media clearly involves every other person in the world. Every other person in the world. We can no longer remain ignorant of what's happening 3,000 miles away because the pictures and the commentary are immediate. They're immediate. I had to make an agreement with myself yesterday. I wasn't going to turn on CNN. And I didn't. I didn't. You know, every once in a while, we need to take a vacation from the news. You know, all of this, all of it, every single thing that I feel a, a sense of frustration about is my own incoherence. My own incoherence. It has nothing to do with anybody else. And the three stages of incoherence are frustration, resignation, and cynicism. 
I don't ever want to get to be a cynic. I don't. I don't want to get to the cynicism stage. So I'm learning that when I feel frustrated, that there's something incoherent in my life. You know, all of this comes to us to have a deeper realization of the infinite power and presence of God. And adversity of any kind has the capacity to blow our belief to the next level of understanding. You know, it's kind of... It blows our belief to the next level of understanding. And it really is all about me because it's something that I need to know. I, it's not something you need to know. Somebody said to me one time, well, you're talking to me directly when I gave a Sunday morning talk. Wait, I only talk because I need to hear what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, really, honestly, that's how it works for me. I'm not up here to preach to anyone. I'm not here to tell you to do something that I haven't already done myself or already felt myself. You know, it's like kind of like a mini explosion in our psyche, a mini explosion. Mine, however, was no mini explosion in watching the events of Charlottesville. There was such a deep sense of, are you freaking kidding me? And I thought we'd handled this years ago. It's clearly an unhealed belief in me and lots of other people that needed to be acknowledged in order for the truth to be revealed about it. I love what Anne Lamott said. Do anybody know Anne Lamott? Oh my God, read anything she writes. She's amazing. She said, I decided that the single most revolutionary thing I could do was to show up for my life and not be ashamed. And yet, there it was, shameful behavior festering under the surface that brought up what I needed to bring up to shine a conscious light upon it. Shameful behavior is very different than being shameful. Being shameful is a lifetime experience. Feeling shameful has a beginning and an end. You see, I didn't know I had a structure of knowing about certain things, or at least I didn't want to know I had been harboring uh, the very same negative and shameful feelings about certain people and certain actions. I was committing thought crimes against people. And while I might not have verbalized them, you see, there's something sanctimonious about thinking about it. Because really, the bad people are the ones who say it out loud. Well, the sanctimonious part of me went someplace else. Those thoughts were taking the toll, their toll on my spiritual equilibrium. I was unsettled. I was anxious. And he, I was even a little bit afraid. I was, wait, not a little bit afraid. I was more than a little bit afraid. Not so much for myself, because I'm coming sort of into the winter of my years, but for my children and my granddaughter. I had just uh, uh, last weekend come off a four-day trip, road trip with my granddaughter. She's going to be 13 in a month. And um, that might be one of the last times I get to do that with her. You know how things change when you get to be 13? Somehow the... the um, well, never mind. I'm not going to own that for her. I'm not going to own that for her. But what I, what I discovered in having conversations with her is that she has more to think about at 12 and a half, almost 13, than I ever did at that same age. I mean, the, the exposure that our kids have is just tremendous. And there is a state of high anxiety with some of the children because my friend Nancy, who is a public health uh, service uh, nurse for many, many years, said that, that she said she's never seen such unrest in the teenagers that she works with. You know, when I discovered that my structure of knowing was less than generous and kind, I was able to really bring it up to shine a conscious light upon it. As Reverend Mike said, when we consciously incorporate spirit into our working lives, things change. Disgruntled employees mellow. Customers are appreciative. The boss lightens up. Coworkers are genial. A feeling of well-being infects the workplace and our world in general. All because we have done the work within our own consciousness to allow spirit to express itself 
as our working life environment. It is all about me, not the ego part of me, as, as um, Mark so beautifully, beautifully said in his creative thought, the rational thinking, generous, kind, and loving me. That's what it's about. I am not immune to feelings of anger, resentment, or judgment. I'm not immune to having those feelings, and, and none of us are here. We should not stuff those feelings. I used to think that if I were just more spiritual, none of those feelings would ever come up, said no one ever. You know, really, it's true. I love what Eckhart Tolle says in The New Earth. When we say I am angry, I'm judgmental, I'm resentful, it's a lifetime commitment to being that. But if I say I feel angry, or I feel resentful, resentment, or I feel judgmental, it has a beginning and an end, as I said earlier. Then we can look at those feelings and investigate them and see where there might just be a structure of knowing that I can change for the better. We can see that there's incoherence in our lives. Our role as good religious scientists is to be the encouragers of others. That's the role that we came here to play. It is to, to make a difference in the world. You know, don't keep this teaching for a secret, as a secret. Take it out into your world and show people who you are. One of the awarenesses, once we have the awareness that something is out of sync, we get to look at ourselves first. It's all about me. And when I see rightly, it will demonstrate rightly in my world. The teaching has the potential to change the way the world works. We can go from struggle to freedom. And yet, yet, we cannot give away something that we don't have. We first prove the law to ourselves by demonstrating good that supports the structure of knowing in our own lives in prosperous and loving ways. In this knowing, then we can raise others up. As our founder, Ernest Holmes, said, when we raise others, we bear witness and honor the spirit within us all. And so, you know, I have no desire to pick up a placard and march in a rally these days. I'm just not up for that. Been there, done that. Better way to achieve peace and tranquility in this lifetime is for all of us to take this teaching out into the world. Let others know what we know. And if you've been coming to the center for a while or you're brand new today and you haven't brought someone with you to church in a while, and maybe it's time for you to think about your own belief system and how it shows up in the world. As Ernest Holmes says on page 33 of The Science of Mind, God is always God no matter our objective situation or our emotional storm. It's the same as what I said earlier. The connection to God's spirit source can be weakened, but the source remains steadfast. It is all about me. So today, go out into your world and work, and your work and your play. Let people know your heart and soul. And by doing so, we create a world that works for everyone, knowing that with God, all things are possible, and so it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.